how are you? Well, I hope you watched my, not the last video, but the one before that. I had quite a lot of views on that one. I talked about Zionism, Christian Zionism, and how it's built on lies. And in this video, I want to continue. In my last video, I kind of talked a little bit about um, the beast system and Babylon the Great. And I just want to continue today on Christian Zionism. Because it is so important today that we do understand the situation. I know Christian Zionism been ha has been around since, of course, dispensationalism. Which is nothing but lies. But we know, and I've made that very clear in my previous videos, that Christian Zionism is extremely... Um, uh, preached, well, not extreme, but it's mainly preached in the evangelical churches. So all of our inter uh, evangelical churches are really now sour, and they're following the wrong people. And yes, Israel is the wrong person. Now, if people want to talk about Antichrist, well, that is definitely Antichrist they're following. There's no doubt in my mind. Now, what Luther called Antichrist, of course, was papacy. But again, in my last video, I actually showed pretty good that most likely Israel is connected very strongly, Zionism, very strongly to papacy and the Jesuits. Jesuits have Zionism in their hands. And they used the Zionists and, of course, the state of Israel as puppets. And they used the Bible, you know, for the worldly Zionists, you don't need to use the Bible. But, again, they used the, the Zionists, the worldly Zionists. They then, of course, are trying to get even the Orthodox Jews on their side and convinced. And then they use even more lies to convince not only the Jews, but also the Christian, the Christians, like the mainly evangelicals, to go along with the lie. Now, right now, again, I, like I said, the evangelical churches are sour. They are hypocrites. All of them. Unless they are not preaching Christian Zionism. Any church that is supporting the state of Israel, and I'm not saying uh, the worldly state, I, I'm, I'm just simply unconditionally, okay, unconditionally supporting the state of Israel is not following Jesus because everything they're preaching is built on lies. And I'm going to show you that, show some more of these lies today. Of course, maybe I should be going to this first lie. I think I have mentioned it, but I want to bring it up again. Since I'm talking about lies, might as well start with Genesis 12. Again, these uh, Zionist Christians they always go back to Genesis 12. And yet, like in everything in dispensationalism, most of them have probably not even read those verses. Oh, yeah, yeah, we are supposed to be blessing Israel. Because if we don't bless Israel, we're cursed. And so, hey, we're using this bat, okay, this bat, to hit Oh, uh, hit these Christians over the head. Scare them, make them feel guilty, motivate them by fear. If you do not bless Israel, you are going to be damned by God. But what this Genesis 12 really says. Now the Lord said to Abram, and he told them to get out of uh, his country, Get away from his family, his father's house, 
go to a land that he will show him. And he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Now listen to this. Uh, I make you a name great and you shall be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. Who? Israel? No, Abraham. How is Abraham a blessing? Well, Abraham is the blessing because he brought forth Messiah. Messiah was promised to him. The seed was promised to him. And this is how he blesses all nations. And this is how he becomes the father of many nations. Now, I don't think that does say here, but there are verses where it says, I will bless you, make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curse you. And in, all, um, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All families. Not just the Jews, not the 12 tribes. All families will be blessed. How? Because all families of this earth, regardless if they are Gentiles or Jews, can accept Jesus. And therefore, Abraham became a blessing for them. Not a curse. Who are being cursed? Those that don't bless Abraham. And why Abraham? Because Abraham brought forth Messiah. In other words, if you are not on Abraham's side, which Jesus said, you are not Abraham's children. He said that to the Pharisees. And believe me, the Pharisees are still around. The Pharisees, the descendants of the Pharisees and the followers of the Pharisees are still around. And he says, you are not Abraham's children. That's what he told them. And he said, I, I, will, I can make children out of these stones. And of course, he didn't use stones. But as we have heard in, in my previous video, that he told the Pharisee, I'll take the kingdom away from me and I will give it to people who will bring the fruits of thereof. And this is exactly what happened. When you accept Messiah as your Lord and Savior, and you put yourself under this new covenant, you belong to Abraham. And this is even what Jesus said. But no, what are these Zionist Christians saying? Oh, we have to uh, bless Israel or else we're going to get cursed. No. Nobody should bless anybody who is against God's plan. And the state of Israel is not in God's plan. And the Jews, most Jews that live there, are not in God's plan. They reject Jesus even today. They would kill him today if he would come again. That's how simple it is. So we bless them? No. No. Absolutely not. No. Okay? I mean, we don't curse them. I don't curse anybody. And I want that they find their Messiah. But this is what they use. They use this all the time. Oh, you know what? If you don't bless Israel, you're going to be cursed. Nobody, no place does it say that. No place. So now I'm going to go to the next lie, which maybe is not as obvious, but if you understand Paul, it becomes obvious. Okay? And it's in Ezekiel um, 37. I've already discussed the, uh, the dry bones that Ezekiel addresses there. And of course, what do the Jews or the Zionist Jews or the Zionist Christians again come up with? What kind of lie? Oh, Israel, the dry bones came alive when Israel, the state of Israel, was founded. Hmm, really, 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 really. I don't see it that way, and I don't think 
uh, God sees it that way either. Why? Because I will go to uh, uh, Paul who understood it very well. The Holy Spirit explained it to him very, very well. Now, of course, those people that don't read Paul, they will not understand it. I had somebody quoting Romans 11 who is supporting Israel and she says, well, the, uh, the branch, the, the, did she say the, um, the new branches were propped in, the wild branches were popped in, propped in. Yeah, but where were they propped in? They were not propped into Israel. They were propped into Jesus. Jesus is the stem. Jesus is the 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 uh, the vine, okay? And we are the branches. The Jews are the branches. The Hebrews are the branches. And he says every branch that does not bear fruit will be cut off. And because of those cut off branches, wild ones were propped in, which are the Gentiles. But every branch that does not bear fruit was cut off. And not because of us, the Gentiles. No, they were cut off because they didn't bring fruit. And so this is very important that we do understand. And the stem with the branches hooked to, that is Jesus. It's not Israel. And this is exactly what we need to understand about Abraham. Abraham brought forth this seed where everybody was supposed to be attached to and get the energy from, get the Holy Spirit from. Not the other way around. Nobody by itself brings any fruit. We only bring fruit if we're attached to the stem, I call it stem, which is Jesus. If we're not connected to him, we'll be cut off because we don't bring any fruit. It's that simple. But I don't think she really understood Paul at all. Yeah, we can quote uh, in these scriptures, but do we really understand it? And again, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we're not propped in, we don't understand it. If we don't bring the fruit, we don't understand it. We can quote anything and everything we want. We can read anything we want in the Bible, and it doesn't click. So if the Jews, the rabbis, read the Old Testament, do you think they understand? No, they don't. That's why they rejected Daniel, for instance, that's why they rejected Moses. They rejected, um, they rejected the prophets. The prophets told them clearly. Daniel told them clearly when Jesus would come, but they reject him. It's very simple. And they have rejected him for so long that their eyes are so shut they, like they cannot see anymore. Okay? And again, what does he say? Paul used... They are blinded in part. What's the other part? Well, that's the part because they just rejected him. They rejected him. And because they rejected him, now they just totally can't see. So how do they uh, now uh, uh, interpret Yeah, this next, I call it, parable with the two sticks? Again, these dry bones in um, 37, they misinterpret. Oh, yeah, these dry bones, they come back to life if Israel comes back to life. B.S. That's all I can say, B.S. And then the next one starts in 15, kingdom, one kingdom, one king. Okay, whose kingdom is, are they talking about here? Okay. He talks about two sticks coming together so let's read that and then explain really what he's talking about okay how do i know 
what it means. Well, I can only understand it probably because I really have the Holy Spirit and because of what Paul is telling us. So we're going to read this, and then in connection to that, we need to understand that with Ephesians, or understand what Ephesians 2, what Paul said in Ephesians 2. Okay, else we cannot understand it. So here it says, now again, who was saying that? That was Ezekiel. When did he live? Um, Ezekiel lived um, num, 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 somewhere during or in between uh, Babylonian captivity or a, a little bit after or when they went into it, okay? So around that time. So they, he lived when they were, after they, are, they were already divorced, Israel, the kingdom of Israel was already divorced, Judah was divorced and sent into captivity. And we need to understand that. So again, he was saying, well, how in the world can Judah and, um, and Israel come together again? And so, all right, choose today. They say, oh, that happened. Oh, that is happening today when they established Israel. Now, is this talking about that kingdom, Israel today? No, this is clearly talking about a kingdom under who? Jesus. So we will see this in a minute. Okay. But let's read the whole thing. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourselves and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Now, who is this? This is kind of really a funny way of putting it. He's talking about Judah and the tribes that st stick, uh, st um, stood with Judah which is only Benjamin, children of Israel, the Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions. In other words, whoever stayed with Judah, which is Benjamin. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And those were the ten tribes that went and separated from Judah and Benjamin. Now, why did he use here not Israel? Why did he use Joseph and the stick of Ephraim? Because Ephraim became the leader of these 10 tribes that left Judah. Now, Ephraim is the youngest son of Joseph. Okay? So why is he so significant? And why Joseph of the ten tribes? Well, it's simple. The blessing was moved, of course, from one generation to the next. And Jacob okay, gave that blessing to Ephraim. In other words, the heir. Okay? He gave that blessing to Ephraim. Like Abraham gave it to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, okay? Through deceit, doesn't matter. It went to Jacob, even though it went through deceit. And then Jacob gave it to Ephraim, not to Joseph. Okay, not to Joseph. Why Ephraim? See, Joseph was there and he says, No, no, father, this is the oldest one, Manasseh. But Jacob said, Nope, nope. The blessing goes to Ephraim the younger. Why? Because he will, the father will be the father of many nations. And that word nation there means Gentile nations. So, what does that have to do with Ephraim? Well, I already said so many times, Ephraim and the ten tribes were sent into captivity. They were divorced from God because they whored, and they went into captivity, and they were scattered among all the nations. And Ephraim, especially 
symbolic Ephraim, the father or the leader of these ten tribes, became really symbolically the father of the Gentile believers. Okay, Gentile believers. And so when we heard, hear about Ephraim, that's what we need to keep in mind. The Ephraim now was, of course, scattered all over. So was Judah. Now they think today, oh, Judah came back. No. Judah has intermingled and intermarried as well. Now, those from Judah that stayed back when Judah was uh, again sent into captivity after by the Romans, those that stayed back, they intermingled again. And even the ones that were sent out uh, uh, all over Europe, they intermingled. So there is no real, you know, clear line back to any of the 12 tribes. And so the 12 tribes right now are only symbolic, really. Okay? They're not only symbolic for... Uh, the tribes, the real tribes, but mainly symbolic for the spiritual descendants of Abraham, which Paul made very, very clear. Okay, very clear. And I know I need to explain all this because it's important. So 10 tribes under Ephraim are gone. They're gone. You can't find them anymore. So Israel, the, the, the state of Israel, has really no right to call themselves Israel. Okay? They can call themselves Judah, but not Israel, because the Israelites are gone. They cannot reclaim the land, even if they could, Okay, because they are dispersed. They became the, 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 the Gentiles. So that is important to understand. So then he says in 17, then join them one to another for yourself into one stick and they will become one in your hand. So who is he really joining? He's joining the Jews and the Gentiles. That's exactly what Paul was preaching all along. That was the message that was given by the Holy Spirit to Paul. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, would you not show us what you mean by these? Say them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they will be one in my hand and the sticks on, uh, on which you write will be in your hand before your eyes. So what he is really saying, I will combine the Jews and the Gentiles someday and they will become one in the Lord and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them for, uh, from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountain of Israel. Now, who is the mountain of Israel? Who is the mountain of the Lord? That is New Jerusalem. Who will live in the New Jerusalem? That is only the bride of Christ. So those are the people that will accept Jesus before the rapture happens. During the resurrection, if you have not accepted Messiah by that time, you will not be living on the mountain of Israel. Okay? And I will make them one nation in the land. Is he talking about the bride of Christ here? Yes. And one king shall be king over them all. 
There shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. Again, these two kingdoms, Judah and Israel, become here some symbolism because they're all scattered. He's talking about spiritual Israel, okay? Spiritual Israel. They will not defile themselves um, uh, anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. That those are the people that Paul was preaching to, saying, hey, you were formerly, uh, you know, Gentiles, but now you have become part of the kingdom of God. And we will read that in Ephesians in a little bit. Now let's continue, though. David, my servant, shall be king over them. Okay? David, my servant, shall be king over them. Who is David, my servant? Is he going to resurrect David? No. He is talking about here, again, David as symbol symbolism for Messiah. Messiah shall be king over them. Messiah, Jesus. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments and observe my statues and do them. And do them. They will observe them and do them. Okay? Not, oh, yeah, I'm saved, and then I'm sitting on my tushy. It's not how you're going to be, uh, how you're going to be saved or part of this kingdom. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Now, listen to this, because this word prince is important. Where can we also find Jesus called prince? In Daniel 9. The prince of the people to come. Okay? Or the prince... The anointed one, the anointed one, the prince. Same word is being used. It's used here by Ezekiel for Messiah. So this prince of the people cannot be referring to Antichrist. This is referring to who? It's referring to Jesus. And this will be a time when Jesus is here. Because it says, uh, David shall be their prince forever, whosoever will be will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will establish them and I'll multiply them, and I will I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and the nations also will know that I know that that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst. What's this, his sanctuary? His sanctuary is the mountain of God or the new Jerusalem. That's the sanctuary. Who lives in it? That's the true believers, the bride of Christ. And of course, there then they're going to be also people that are servants. They will not make it in the rapture, and they have to go through the wrath of God, and they're left over at the end. And they will only have a human body and will resettle, okay, around the land, around the mountain of the Lord. They will not live in the mountain of the Lord because that's for the bride. They will live around. There's some place where it says that the Judah will receive Gaza. Right? Today's Gaza, people. Okay, that little strip of land, the leftover uh, Jews that are left over after the wrath of God will settle there. That little strip, that's how many Jews will be left over. 
because the rest will be killed because they didn't accept Jesus. It's not my problem. So this is not talking about today. It's talking about a time when Jesus is actually going to be here. He is going to be the servant, the David servant, okay? My servant David, Jesus, that he promised to Abraham. Now, if you're familiar with Paul, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Or when Paul talked about this, the two sticks coming together as one. This is not what's happening today because there is no way Israel can be found. They mixed. Even like I said, a lot of the Jews that used that stayed in Palestine, okay? Let's say Palestine during when the, the Jews were dispersed after 70 AD, they still stayed there and they mixed with the people there and again, they worshipped the gods of the heathen there. Okay, and they became Muslim. So what you have in that land today are still Jews mixed with the heathens. And believe me, even the Jews that left and try to stay separate, they're not necessarily 100% Jews or not even 50%. They're just totally watered down. And it doesn't matter. Because what he's talking about here is bringing Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles together. So now let's go really, really fast to Ephesians. And I have talked about Ephesians so many times. I've read it so many times. But now that becomes also clear. I'm going to talk... Ephesians 2, and we're going to go to 11. Remember, I read that before, I think, Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, and those is all of Ephraim, who are called, or even the Jews that mixed with uh, the, the other Gentiles and became even Muslims, who are uncircumcision because, hey, hey, they're uncircumcised now, but it's called the circumcisions made in the flesh by hand. And at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, who is again the commonwealth of Israel? That's the true believers that stayed with the stem. Okay? The commonwealth of Israel is built on Messiah and strangers from the covenants of promise. What is the covenant of promise? The covenant of promise is through the seed from Abraham through Messiah. You accept Messiah, you are co-heir with Christ. Paul is saying that too. If you want to look it up, look, put in co-heir with Christ and you find everything that Paul said about being co-heirs with Christ. Actually, I think Peter even talked about that as well in his letters. But now Christ is, uh, let me see, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is everybody. Even the branches that were cut off, the old branches, let's call them old branches, that were cut off, now can be propped in again. Okay? For he himself is our peace. What is he? Peace. Is he war? No. He is peace. Why? Because he wants to bring both of them together. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained 
in the ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from two thus making peace again that he might reconcile them both to god in one body through the cross thereby putting to death enmity Jews and Gentiles are at war right now. We can't see that in Israel today. Jews think they are better. They think they have to kill the Palestinians, not give them equal rights. That is not what God or Jesus had in mind. Okay? He wants to reconcile both of them to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death enmity and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near for through him we both have access to one spirit in the father now do the Jews or the Jewish government know that no they are very far away from god how about these Zion, this this Christian Zionists, do they understand that? No, because they are also a very far away from God. Then he continues to say, "Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God." having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord and in whom you also are being built together as a dwelling place of God in the spirit now now you see how all this fits together with the old testament We are no longer too split apart. We no longer have to quarrel and fight each other. Now, if if for Israel would follow Jesus, it would be easy to implement this. But Israel is not following Jesus, and these Zionist Christians, they're not following Jesus either. They can't. because of what they stand for they are supporting a, a, a crooked crooked and uh, corrupt country a country that was founded by the beast system and babylon the great that's that's what happened babylon the great and the beast system established that state and israel and the government is in debt to the beast system and of course babylon the great too in my last video you could see exactly i hope you had time to watch um the um the video about the chesuits you can see clearly what's going on so we are back to the bottom line and that is we are waiting if we were true followers of Christ we are waiting for Jesus our king and not for anybody to establish their own country Now anything we're doing in this world is supporting the beast system in Babylon the Great. Please watch my videos with the Antichrist um so you understand who Babylon the Great is. My last video talked about it a little bit. But if we are supporting Israel, we are supporting Satan and his system. what israel is trying to do is establish their own kingdom and again screaming in god's face that they're still not ready to follow him and that's pretty bad because guess what 
The wrath God has for them is still not over. Why do you think he sent them in captivity in 70 AD? Because he was angry with them. And I think a lot of Orthodox Church know that. They may not know 100% that it was because they rejected Messiah, but they knew they did something wrong. And that's why there's a lot of Orthodox Jews that do not agree with Zionism. And they believe they have to wait until Messiah in order to go back to their land. And it's not even their land because they lost it through a divorce. It's not their land anymore. And Jesus clearly said, I will give the kingdom of God into, uh, to a people that will bring the fruits thereof. I said that in my video, not the last one, but the one before that. People make a good decision because if you are not on the side of God in this, and this is what it is, uh, people. It's not, oh, are you on the side of Israel, on the side of Palestine or, Pal or Hamas or whatever it is. Oh, you know, you know, I had somebody that was really attacking me again and say, oh, you're a Holocaust denier or, oh, you're anti-Semitic. No, I'm neither a Holocaust denier nor anti-Semitic. I want to know the truth. People had, we don't even know the whole truth about Holocaust. We don't even know the whole truth about when, what was that again? Uh, October 7th, I think that's when it happened. You know, this new 9-11, Israel 9-11, we didn't even, people, we don't even know exactly what happened in the first 9-11. And you really think they are going to give us the truth about Israel's 9-11? No. I don't think so. We don't know what went on. But no, they are just pushing and pushing and pushing to prove, you know, and, and make people feel guilty and support this effort of Israel to bring nothing but, no, they're not bringing peace. They're bringing even more attention. They think they're going to win, but God is not on their side. God is not on their side. There is nothing from a prophet or in the Bible that tells them that they need to go and establish, what, an Israel, a, a country of Israel, and then destroy all the people in the land? What is, let me see, what was it again? Uh, let me look it up. Luke. I think that's what I le uh, read last. Luke. Luke 21. And then we go to 24. What does it say? Remember? Sorry, it takes me a while. I don't know why it takes that long. It just drives me up a wall. It really does. Anyways, 24. And Jerusalem... That's in 24. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You know what? If they want to eradicate all the Gentiles, Jesus will come pretty soon. He will come. Because it says here, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And that is when Jesus returns. That's how long the Gentiles will trample Jerusalem underfoot. Yeah, people wake up. We're living in some very crucial time. We all have to make very important decisions here. What side are we on? Okay, what side are we on? And I, again, I'm not talking about I'm talking about, are you on the side of Satan or your side of Jesus? What side are you on? Are you on the side of the system, the beast system? Or are you on the side of Jesus that is going to come and establish his, uh, his, um, his kingdom? Very important question. 
And if you're on side of Jesus, you need to go and rally behind Jesus and what he said in the Bible. And not in misinterpret or run after people that misinterpret things. Coming to an end. Let the Holy Spirit guide you always.